very nice to see that there are so many people here today. Thank you for coming, and I hope that you will enjoy this talk. Just a quick notice that this presentation will be recorded, so feel free to turn off your cameras. We're very delighted to see you here today for a discussion on the risks and rewards of long-termism, and to have Bill Torres to speak for us today. Many of EA Denmark's members are long-termists, which is why we're particularly excited to get to host this event. Effective altruism is all about exchanging ideas and forming accurate beliefs about the world. So we are very happy to generate a debate as part of being a culture of truth seeking. There are many definitions of long-termism. One such definition could be the following, that long-termism places an emphasis on the importance of the long-term future of humanity. Long-termists tend to believe that humanity has the potential for a very bright future, along for the possibilities of trillions of happy lives. This has led many to conclude that existential risks are very important to prevent as they would prevent all these lives from existing. If you could reduce existential risk even a minuscule amount, then it would in theory be more valuable than almost any other intervention imaginable. This, however, is a conclusion that Bill Torres believes we shouldn't accept at face value. Bill is currently a PhD candidate at Leibniz University in Hanover. He has written about eschatology, existential risks, and on the nature and causes of human extinction. Today, we will speak for approximately 30 minutes. Thereafter, we will continue with a Q&A session at Slido. You can use the same code as for the question. Here, you can ask your questions for Phil during the presentation, and you can upload those questions you think are especially good. When we begin the Q&A session, I will ask the most uploaded questions to Phil. So, Phil, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Elliot will make you a host and you can connect your PowerPoint presentation and begin whenever you feel comfortable. Yes. All right, you can see that? Yes. Okay, great. <clears throat> um, actually, give me just one second here to minimize. Um, All right. All right. Thanks so much for having me. Um, it was a real uh, pleasure and uh, surprise uh, to to get the invitation. So I'm really really happy to uh, to to be able to share some of my uh, criticisms uh, with uh, EAs, and I'm particularly interested in uh, the discussion. So I have 35 slides. I'm going to try to get through them as quickly as possible because I'd much prefer to uh, engage in um, uh, a dialogue rather than just uh, drone on. So, um, uh, so Luca already uh, mentioned what you know long-termism is, and I suspect that you know pretty much everybody who's attending uh, is familiar with the term, but. Um, let me, sorry, let me pause for one second. I'm trying to minimize, there we go. Okay, I think this is gonna work. Yep, okay. Um, so one definition is it's an ethical view that is especially concerned with the impacts of our actions upon uh, the long-term future. That's of course from Toby Ward's uh, 2020 book, The Precipice. Uh, my focus, uh, the focus of, of the critiques, uh, which um, if you've read those critiques, much of this uh, presentation will be um, uh, something you've already heard before, uh, but nonetheless, okay, so my focus has been strong long-termism, which Greaves and McCaskill in 2021 uh, defined as the view that uh, uh, our impact on the future uh, is the most important feature of our actions today. Uh, so there are two versions of this, axiological and deontic, and that's just sort of a basic division within ethics axiological concerns value, deontic concerns, uh, the normative question of what we ought to do. Uh, so Greaves and McCaskill also wrote in 2019 that we believe that axiological and deontic long-termism are of the utmost importance. If society came to adopt these views, much of what we would prioritize in the world today would change. So intimately connected with this is, of course, the idea of existential risk, which again, I'm pretty sure everybody uh, uh, is intimately uh, familiar with. 
Uh, nonetheless, um, in 2002, Bostrom defined existential risk as any event that would either annihilate Earth originating intelligent life or permanently and drastically curtail its potential. Uh, his 2013 uh, follow up article on the topic uh, essentially defined an existential catastrophe as any event that would prevent us from reaching and sustaining a state of technological maturity, uh, by which he meant. Uh, the attainment of capabilities affording a level of economic productivity and control over nature close to the maximum that could feasibly be achieved. Uh, Ord more succinctly defines it in, uh, in the precipice as any risk that threatens the destruction of humanity's long-term potential. So this leads to the obvious question, what is our long-term potential? And uh, perusing the literature, it seems clear, and I think this is clear uh, in Ord's book, it's certainly quite clear in a lot of the stuff that Bostrom has written that there are three uh, essential components to our uh, long-term potential that are non-negotiable. One is colonizing space. The other is, um, is using you know, radical enhancement technologies to uh, create a post-human species. And the other is the ethical uh, and axiological component, which is total uh, utilitarianism, an impersonalist uh, interpretation of that, which I'll, I'll get to in a moment. Uh, so Bostrom, with respect to transhumanism, Bostrom is arguably the most prominent uh, transhumanist so far of the, the century. Um, and in fact, he originally defined existential risk in terms of creating uh, a post-human uh, civilization. So historically, what happened was, you know, the modern transhumanist movement emerged in the 1980s, 1990s. And the idea was that, you know, we could use these advanced technologies, uh, genetic engineering, nanotechnology, and so on to um, you know, radically uh, augment our cognitive capacities, our lifespan, and so on. Uh, but it was quickly realized that these technologies also uh, are dually usable, extremely powerful, and um, could be accessible to small groups, terrorist uh, uh, groups, or on the side of agents. Um, and so, so this was widely realized right around the turn of the, the 21st century. One response was that we should uh, not develop these technologies because they're much too dangerous. And so this was uh, this view was represented by Bill Joy uh, in his, his famous 2000 uh, Wired article on the topic. Uh, the transhumanists though said, actually, no, we, we do need to develop these technologies because of the, the goal of becoming post-human. But uh, um, one way to then avoid some kind of existential catastrophe is essentially to found a new field of philosophical and empirical uh, uh, research. And that's you know, in order to neutralize the bad aspects of technology uh, and realize the, the good aspects. And that's essentially how existential risk studies was, was born. Uh, okay, so moving on to the next one, utilitarianism. Uh, there's a uh, fundamental question here, um, which is what is the proper response to value uh, to something that's valuable or intrinsically valuable? And the uh, response is to multiply it, to promote it, to maximize it. What matters is the moral bottom line. It's not total net profit as in business, but total net value. Uh, morality, essentially, one could say, abhors a vacuum. Uh, so I would say that in practice, the effective altruism community, uh, which an early name proposed for it was the effective utilitarian community, is uh, very utilitarian in its uh, moral orientation. Uh, most members are utilitarians. I think there was a survey out from a year ago or something that showed this. Uh, all the notable leaders have made statements in the past suggesting that they subscribe to or are most sympathetic with uh, utilitarianism. Uh, and the notion of the, the, the notion that one ought to prioritize the mitigation of existential risk uh, absolutely makes most sense when it's it is founded on this. Uh, underlying uh, ethical theory. And in fact, there's there, you know, person affecting moral theories, such as um, the contractualism uh, proposed by Scanlon, uh, that do not identify the, the uh, axiological opportunity cost of human extinction as morally relevant at all. Uh, human extinction would be bad because the, the insofar as the catastrophe leading up to the point where there are no more humans would be bad. Otherwise, uh, it, it would not. Um, so I will now identify um, or, or go through a number of uh, potential problems with this uh, view. 
uh, or at least I would argue that these are these are uh, problems, very serious problems. So the first, let's begin with the question: What is at stake? Uh, two answers to this: One is astronomical value, and two is a techno-utopian uh, transhumanist world. Uh, and the latter maybe finds its most um, uh, you know, exemplary expression in Bostrom's uh, letter from Utopia, which he originally wrote in 2008 and updated in, in 2020. Mm. I won't read this whole uh, excerpt, but he you know, essentially imagines uh, a you know, magical future in which uh, you know, people, there's, there's so much pleasure that they sprinkle it in their tea is one of the lines he has. Uh, people are super intelligent, they, they live forever. And that, this, this is essentially the uh, sort of utopian world that has emerged from the transhumanist uh, ideology. So with respect to astronomical value, the question is how many future people could there be? In his uh, book, Superintelligence, Bostrom, calculates that there could be 10 to the 58 uh, future human beings. Most of these would be digital consciousnesses living, quote, quote uh, rich and happy lives while interacting with one another, another in virtual environments. In vast computer simulations, running on computronium spread throughout a fraction of our future light cone powered by Dyson spheres, uh, perhaps with cognitive processes that are sped up to realize as much value uh, as possible per unit time. In McCaskill in 2021, they calculate that there could be 10 to the 45 digital beings that are Milky Way alone. I would suggest that a lot of these numbers are quite misleading. There's a non-zero chance that uh, we could somehow figure out the ultimate prison escape, slip into a neighboring universe, or perhaps there are other strat strategies that have been discussed by serious physicists, such as somehow delaying the heat death uh, of the universe, uh, but otherwise, we could just circumvent the heat death by tunneling into a neighboring universe or something of the sort, thereby per perhaps doing this iteratively and extending the lifespan of our uh, evolutionary lineage or our civilization indefinitely. So th again, there's a non-zero chance, uh, as, as in the known laws of physics don't absolutely rule this out, that the total number of future people could be infinite. This is something that, in fact, uh, Bostrom and Sirkovic, I believe it was a 2000 uh, paper, uh, explicitly noted that there could be an infinite number of future people because there could be ways of avoiding the heat death or, or proton decay, whatever. So there is already some talk of Pascal's mugging, uh, has been talk among uh, the existential risk, within the existential risk community about Pascal's mugging when very low probabilities are combined with astronomical payoffs, expected value theory prescribes counterintuitive actions. So this is a problem that arises with the numbers above, such as the 10 to the 45 number, the 10 to 58 number as well. But on the long term account, the real problem, I would argue, is Pascal's wager. Because there could be infinite value, infinite future people who realize net positive quantities of pleasure, if you're a hedonist, every drop of our resources should be funneled into preventing existential risk and figuring out how to delay or uh, circumvent the entropic demise of the cosmos. I would argue that this reasoning is, is dangerous in both cases with respect to both the, the wager and the, the mugging. So Bostrom argues, has argued in, in, uh, on several occasions Essentially this, imagine two buttons. If you push A, billions and billions of actual living, breathing, real people would be saved from, say, being electrocuted to death. If you push button B, the probability that 10 to the 54 uh, currently, uh, sorry, current non-persons, the individual, merely possible individuals, people who don't exist and might never exist, but who would live 10,000 years from now in vast computer simulations will never be born, that probability will fall by a very negligible amount. Which button should you push? According to Bostrom, the, the obvious answer is to push uh, button A and allow those people to be electrocuted. Because we're talking about astronomical future value, uh, you'd be a moral monster if you didn't push uh, button A. Uh, I saw that uh, Ole Hagstrom is in the, the audience. Uh, this is a 
uh, a passage from his uh, 2016 book, Here Be Dragons, which is, is I think, one of the best books uh, ever written on, on existential risk issues. It contains this one passage, which I think uh, captures the essence of the concern here in a very uh, vividly described uh, vignette. So I'll read the next few slides have some long excerpts and I'll just, I'll read uh, all of them because I think they're important. So uh, I'll go through this quickly. I Referring to the claim that Boster made that I just mentioned, uh, Hagstrom writes, I feel extremely uneasy about the prospect that those calculations might become recognized among politicians and decision makers as a guide to policy worth taking literally. It is simply too reminiscent of the old saying, if you wanna make an omelet, you must be willing to break a few eggs, which has typically been used to explain that a bit of genocide or so might be a good thing, if it can contribute to the goal of creating a future utopia. So imagine a situation where the head of the CIA explains to the US president that they have credible evidence that somewhere in Germany, which is where I happen to be, there is a lunatic who is working on a doomsday weapon and tends to use it to wipe out humanity and that this lunatic has a one in a million chance of succeeding. They have no further information on the identity or whereabouts of this lunatic. If the president has taken Bostrom's argument to heart, and if he knows how to do the arithmetic, he may conclude that it is worthwhile conducting a full-scale nuclear assault on Germany to kill every single person within its borders. And that's, I think, a true statement. That is a real risk that political leaders, people who have... Uh, you know, the, the, the rights, powerful individuals could take Bostrom's view seriously and the consequences could be quite bad. So um, Steven Pinker, let's see, hold on. Um, I'm hearing people talking in the background and also it seems that my presentation here is frozen. Okay, there we go. Can someone just confirm that they're, they can still hear me? Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay, good, good. Sorry about that. Uh, so similarly, Steven Pinker uh, addresses the profound dangers posed by identifying some telos or end state that humanity must above all else realize because it could contain infinite or astronomical value. So in his uh, uh, 2011 book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, he writes, utopian ideologies invite genocide for two reasons. One is that they set up a pernicious utilitarian calculus. In a utopia, everyone is happy forever, so its moral value is infinite. Most of us agree that it's eth ethically permissible to divert a runaway trolley that threatens to kill five people onto a sidetrack where would kill only one. But suppose it were a hundred million lives one could save by diverting the trolley, or a billion, or projecting to the indefinite future, in, uh, infinitely many. How many people would it be permissible to sacrifice to attain that infinite good? A few million can seem like a pretty good bargain. So these these sort of utopian, uh, you know, eschatological uh, views, which is essentially what um, what the what emerges, I think, from a lot of the long term, at least the, the foundational long termist uh, literature. Uh, I, I, th I think it can be very, very dangerous. In fact, the, many of the most horrendous conflicts in human history, uh, such as World War II, not World War I, sorry, the Taping Rebellion and so on, were driven, were motivated in some crucial way by utopian or millenary visions of a future paradise. The case of Hitler, he talked about the Thousand Year Reich, uh, Taping Rebellion, that was an, an apocalyptic uh, movement in the 1800s uh, in, um, in China. And I, there was, I don't know, something like, up to 30 million uh, deaths. There's a very, very long history of such ideologies, uh, apologies for the typos here, such ideologies causing tremendous harm. Uh, for more, you, you check out my uh, paper, The Clash of Eschatologies, which sort of catalogs some of these historical incidents. So just to be clear, the argument is not that there are long-termists right now who would commit horrible atrocities. That is not what I believe. It's that the ideology itself leads to or pushes one toward extremely dangerous means and sorts of reasoning, the sort of reasoning, which could easily be exploited 
by people who, as Hagstrom says, who take Bostrom's words to heart to justify devastating atrocities for the sake of the greater cosmic good. That is astronomical infinite value in a techno utopian paradise. I am worried about the ideology, which I take to be something of an information hazard. So that is the target of my, my critiques. Uh, Peter Singer just recently happened to make a very similar point. He wrote uh, that the dangers of treating uh, extinction risk as humanity's overriding concern should be obvious. Viewing current problems through the lens of existential risk to our species can shrink those problems to almost nothing while justifying almost anything that increases our odds of surviving long enough to spread beyond Earth. This point I'll return to in just a moment. He continues, but as people have recently noted, viewing current problems other than our species extinction through the lens of long-termism and existential risk can shrink those problems once again to almost nothing while providing a rationale for doing almost anything to, create, in, to increase our odds of surviving long enough to spread beyond Earth. Marx's vision of communism as the goal of all human history provided Lenin and Stalin with a justification for their crimes. And the goal of a thousand year Reich, as I just mentioned, was in the eyes of the Nazis, sufficient reason for exterminating or enslaving those deemed uh, racially inferior. I am not suggesting, uh, he, he writes, and I would agree, that any present exponents of the hinge of history idea would countenance atrocities. But then Marx too never contemplated that a regime governing in his name would terrorize its people. So this, again, I'm, I'm concerned about this ideology, uh, this, the, the meme of long-term is as it's been articulated in uh, notable papers within the literature, propagating and influencing, you know, government uh, uh, officials and, you know, business leaders and so on. So indeed, one could easily quote Bostrom himself to justify such atrocities, just as some have quoted Marx justify all sorts of homicidal horrors. There are far too many examples to list even on a bunch of slides. So here are just a few. Boston describes a breakdown of the global civilization that is recoverable, uh, and hence not an existential catastrophe, as a giant massacre for man, but with respect to the possibility of, of creating astronomical value in a techno-utopian world, it's a small misstep for mankind. So in other words, just there is a minimization, a trivialization of giant massacres uh, because he's zooming out, assuming a certain theory of value, which we'll discuss more in a, in a moment, the impersonalist uh, uh, interpretation uh, or, inter or position, and then saying that, well, when you zoom out far enough, you know, even the largest disasters uh, become very, very small. So he it says the following about the two world wars, which of course includes the Holocaust, uh, AIDS, the Chernobyl, Chernobyl uh, nuclear accident, tragic as such events are to people immediately affected in the big picture of things, even the worst of these catastrophes are mere ripples on the surface of the great sea of life. He argues that we must not fritter away our finite resources on, again, apologies for the, the typos, uh, on, quote, feel-good projects of suboptimal efficacy, which leads Singer in a 2015 book, uh, I believe it was on, uh, on um, effective altruism, to write, to refer to donating to help the global poor or reduce animal suffering as a feel good project on which resources are frittered away is harsh, harsh language and I would very much concur with that. He's also explicitly endorsed the use of preemptive war violence as a last resort to avoid an existential catastrophe. An existential catastrophe, of course, is not just, you know, a nuclear holocaust or some kind of ecophagic disaster. It also includes things like technological stagnation. So he's even suggested that we should seriously consider implementing a global invasive real-time surveillance system to prevent civilizational devastation from malicious actors empowered by emerging tech. This is also a point that I'll return to later on. So there's plenty enough material here for someone who takes Boston's view very seriously, is motivated by fantasies of techno-utopian world, uh, astronomical infinite value amongst the constellations to justify to him or herself that extreme measures are worth taking to ensure the full realization of our vast and glorious potential quoting word. So let's move on now to the, to the next problem, uh, which, is, which has to do with the, this sort of impersonalist uh, theory of, of value, impersonalist interpretation of, of utilitarianism. Whose interests should we take into consideration in our moral deliberations? So 
I'll give you two examples. Uh, first, just a simple trolley problem. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows that, uh, and, and Pinker, of course, just uh, gestured at this a moment ago, but if you have uh, you know five people on uh, a track and a runaway trolley, you're right by a railroad uh, switch, you can divert the trolley so that it kills one person. Most people would agree that you ought to switch the, uh, pull the, the railway switch. Uh, then you you know you save five people, uh, uh, five innocent people, one innocent person uh, perishes. It's it's uh, a tragedy, but it's the best uh, of the possible outcomes. So now consider another scenario where, for reasons that are causally obscure, and would take a long time to explain, or perhaps we can't really even understand, if the runaway trolley continues straight, it will not hit any, there's nobody on the track for it to hit, but it will trigger some sort of concatenation of causes that ultimately will lead to five individuals who would have had happy lives never being born. On the uh, other track, there's one individual and uh, who is real. And the question is, should you divert the, the trolley for somebody who accepts the reasoning behind, behind some of the, claims that Bostrom and other long-termists have made, you absolutely should pull the, the switch and kill the one actual person in order to enable five individuals uh, to come to exist. Because if you look at things in an impersonal sense, if you, if you understand value in, uh, in an impersonal manner, and you accept this, the, the total version of utilitarianism, the scenario in which you pull the switch is going to realize more uh, value ultimately than the one in which you uh, don't, uh, all, all things uh, being equal. So there's another scenario you could, you could imagine, you know, the classic ticking time bomb situation where there's, let's say, a perfect knowledge about the efficacy of, of torture, and you know for a fact that this individual has planted a bomb that will kill uh, one million people, it, uh, you know, let's say in, you know, uh, a year or something. Uh, if you don't it, use the means of torture to extract certain information uh, right away. So there are a lot of, th then the question of course is, is ought you to do that? And there are a lot of moral theories that converge on the answer you should. Again, th this, this scenario is not one I think that would ev ever obtain in the real world. But in this highly idealized scenario, a lot of moral theories, yes, would say that, that you are justified in uh, saving the, the, the uh, one million people by, you know, engaging in, by, by inflicting all sorts of harms on this one particular individual. But now imagine another situation where somebody has figured out a way that will, a, a way to prevent, rather than kill one million people, prevent one million people from being born in a hundred years. Uh, and the happiness of these people, let's say, let's see, all these, these individuals have you know, happiness level of five. So it's, it's a net positive. Then the question is, should you torture the individual to ensure that these net positive lives will come into existence in the future? And again, if you accept the underlying, the reasoning that underlies a lot of the, the long-termist uh, claims, you ought to say, yes, you should torture this, this individual. Again, torturing the individual will uh, produce more you know, total value impersonally conceived than if you don't. I very strongly disagree with that. I think you should not pull the railway switch and let the five non-persons remain non-persons, then kill the one person. I think you should not torture uh, in, 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 this individual in order to ensure that one million uh, extra people are with happy lives are born in the future. So for total impersonalist utilitarians, that is uh, for total um, impersonal, impersonalist utilitarians, people, you and me are mere means to an end, the realization of value. We are fungible value containers, swappable, interchangeable, like mass produced cars or whatever. On this view, the loss of a value container containing five units of value is no different than the failure of a value container that would contain five units of value from coming into existence. So death and non-birth 
are intrinsically the same, morally speaking, all things being equal. The, uh, the, the view underlying this is, as I mentioned before, it's impersonalism in contrast to uh, person affecting view. So you might hear about uh, totalism and the total view, both of which smuggle in impersonalism. So both are, are standardly defined uh, in impersonalist terms. Um, but in theory, one could hold a, a total utilitarian view uh, that is also person affecting, where you just say we need to maximize the total amount of value uh, within the, uh, for example, if you're a presentist, within the population of people who actually just exist right now. So for the impersonalist, to, to paraphrase uh, Bernard Williams, who was, a, who was a, um, an energetic critic of this view, happiness is looking for a person rather than people looking for happiness. So we exist for the sake of maximizing value, that is as means to an end, rather than value existing for the sake of benefiting us. Living, breathing, actual people who, unlike merely possible people in computer simulations 10 trillion years from now, can bleed and cry. So this results in uh, a numbers game. It, it's morality is ultimately reduced to, to just number crunching. One gets the results above through this sort of numbers game to propose some half plausible numbers pulled out of a hat about how many people there could be in the future. Uh, merely assume that these people will have net positive amounts of value and then use expected value theory to declare that focusing on the far future thousands, millions, billions, trillions of years from now matters most. As soon as, but indeed, as soon as you recognize that there could be an infinite number of future people, perhaps with happy lives, all conversational argumentation debate must end, since what matters is the total amount of value impersonally conceived as tallied up from this impartial point of view of the universe, as Henry Sidgwick famously put it, mitigating existential risks and figuring out how to escape the heat death really does look like the most important task of humanity, period. I take this to be a reductio of the position. And in fact, there are many, many philosophers who see Bostrom's 2003 paper on astronomical waste as a reductio of total impersonalist utilitarianism. Uh, so as Vigen uh, Masrani uh, writes in a, I think he published this maybe last year, so quite good critique of long-termism, which I'd be happy to share the, the URL with people if they're interested. He writes, I think, however, that long-termism has the potential to destroy the effective altruism movement entirely because by fiddling with the numbers, the above reasoning can be used to squash funding for any charitable cause whatsoever. Again, that's what Peter Singer was gesturing at. Um, yeah. So, okay, the third problem. Uh, this gets at the possibility that long-termism is in some sense uh, self-defeating. So a friend of mine who's at one of the major experts institute has described Bostrom's view as basically capitalism on steroids. So technological maturity, this is the ultimate goal, the uh, attainment of this and then the, the maintenance of technological maturity, um, which, which is clear if you look at his um, quadripartite, his four part uh, uh, taxonomy of existential risk failure modes. So the technological maturity involves the complete subjugation of nature and the maximization of economic productivity. Why? To maximize impersonal value. This worldview, which is uniquely Western, is not only unquestioned among most long-termists, as far as I can see, but has, of course, driven the environmental crisis that now threatens to cause profound harms to people around the world, especially in the global South. So furthermore, uh, the fact is, that the overwhelming source of global catastrophic risk today arises from technology itself. Consider, for example, the default level of existential risk from natural causes per 100 years is, you know, maybe one in 10,000. That's Ord's estimate, which I, I would question. I, I think it's an overestimate. But um, no, and also note that our species, you know, we've survived two volcanic super eruptions with sticks and stones, and yeah, it's a very, very low probability. In contrast, this century, Ord himself suggests that there's a one in six chance of an existential catastrophe. Um, and in fact, many other scholars have suggested a higher probability. Uh, Bostrom himself said that there might be a 20% chance of extinction before 2100. Uh, as most of you no doubt know, uh, Lord Martin Rees wrote in 2003 that there's a 50% chance of civilizational collapse by the end of the century. Uh, my view is that civilizational collapse is 
very likely. Extinction is probably low unless we create uh, artificial superintelligence, which uh, seems like it seems to make the probability of extinction uh, extremely high. So the point is that we are pushing ourselves to the very edge of the precipice. If survival is what matters, then we would be way, way better without technology. Uh, I'm not prescribing this necessarily as a view, but I think it's worth just noting. Technology is making the world much more dangerous rather than uh, safe. However, uh, this is sort of a catch-22. Because what matters is the telos of techno-utopia and astronomical uh, infinite value, and since technology is necessary to achieve these ends, the failure to continue to develop what everyone admits are profoundly dangerous artifacts is not an option. It would itself constitute an existential catastrophe. Uh, I mentioned technological stagnation earlier. That's just that's one failure mode. It's just remaining at roughly our level of technological development. So we have to plow forward and create these dangerous technologies. And some might argue that that's madness. So with respect to what, what I just mentioned a moment ago, technology is making the world much more dangerous than uh, safe. Boston Company do have a response. This is false. It's not technology's fault, but our fault. And the way to correct this is, in fact, to use technology to redesign us, because we are the problem, not technology. Technology is the solution. Always more technology. All problems are technical problems in need of a technical solution. So we must not blame technology, as Ord and Bostrom both write, uh, for increasing the chance of doom by many orders of magnitude in uh, an incredibly short period of time, with no reason to believe that this trend will reverse. Why? The answer concerns what philosophers of technology call the value neutrality thesis. This finds expression in the, the NRA's slogan, guns don't kill people, people kill people. So there, there was a, uh, a Cambridge University uh, philosopher named Kim Casper Hecker in his 2018 dissertation, which is excellent. He examines uh, the existential risk uh, um, framework and he, he writes that when seen against the background of any strand of philosophy of technology, the first thing one knows is that existential risk theory actually lacks a theory of technology. It never asks what technology is. This is both surprising and unsurprising. It's surprising insofar as technology assumes center stage in existential risk theory, and it would seem only natural to ask what it actually is that one attributes such an important role to. If technology is our destiny, should we not uh, question uh, he's referring to, to an a article written by Heidegger, a question concerning technology. Uh, at the same time, it does not come as a surprise because there is a default conception. This is a default conception uh, that the existential risk theory uh, is built upon. So this brings us back So to, to the question, is long-termism potentially self-defeating? The result is that, I suggested that Ian article, uh, long-termism is self-defeating. Perhaps the only way to actually attain something like existential security or the most existential security we could achieve is by abandoning the long-termist ideologies with its underlying uh, you know, imperatives to exploit, subjugate, maximize, uh, and so on. So I, I'll just read what I wrote. Uh, not only could its fanatical emphasis on, and this is just uh, recapitulating what I mentioned earlier, its fanatical emphasis on fulfilling our long-term potential lead people to, for example, neglect non-existential climate change, prioritize the rich over the poor, which is something that Beckstead has, has written about, and perhaps even justify preemptive violence and atrocities for the greater cosmic good, but it also contains within it the very tendencies, such as Baconianism, capitalism, value neutrality, that have driven humanity inches away from the precipice of destruction. Long-termism tells us to maximize economic productivity, our control over nature, our presence in the universe, the number of simulated people who exist in the future, the total amount of impersonal value, and so on. But to maximize, we must develop increasingly powerful and dangerous technologies. Failing to do so would itself be an existential catastrophe. Not to worry though, because technology is not responsible for our worsening predicament. And hence the fact that most risks stem directly from technology is no reason to stop creating more technology. Rather, the problem lies with us, which means only that we must create even more technology to transform ourselves into cognitively and morally enhanced uh, post-humans. By the way, somebody has their microphone on. Um, I can hear some, some shuffling about. Um, I'm gonna skip this because I'm already uh, at the very end of my time. So I'll just mention, uh, a fifth problem, which concerns space colonization and the assumption that 
which I know some people have recently written about, uh, uh, published something on the EA forum, which is interesting. But for the most part, it's just been this, this background assumption that has gone completely unquestioned. Why I think that uh, the expected value of the future is positive. Some recent scholarship, most notably by uh, Johns Hopkins, a political scientist named Daniel Dutney, has called into question the idea that colonizing space would be beneficial, peaceful, uh, in, uh, and so on. See chapter 10 of his superb Dark Skies book for more. Two, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to finish up here within uh, six or seven minutes, j just so you know. I, I apologize for, for going over. So let's focus on space colonization for a moment. Two scenarios that I'm bracketing. First, that extraterrestrial intelligences exist, and second, uh, that we create a value misaligned superintelligence. Th those are defeaters of this whole argument. So, all right, my screen has frozen again. Apologies. See uh, an example of technological risk. Got a whole bunch of people waiting, and the computer's not working. Um, genuine apologies. Give me one second. It's all right. <laughs> ah, there we go. Yes. Okay, so three premises that many space expansionists themselves would accept. One, venturing into space will result in phylogenesis via adaptive radiation. So it's, it's going to uh, uh, foster the, the multiplicity of uh, post-human species. These, these species could be radically different than us. Uh, you have completely unique emotional repertoire, psychological profiles, cognitive systems, body types, and so on. They could also invent entirely novel political systems, ideologies, religions, uh, normative worldviews. What is the cause of this? Uh, you know, it's probably going to be cyborgization or some sort of integration uh, uh, of biology and technology or complete replacement of biology with technology. Uh, why? Well, radically different extraterrestrial environments, something analogous to uh, uh, genetic drift, something like that. But that's something that pretty much everybody agrees. In fact, this is one th uh, thing that the space expansionists are in the literature are excited about possibility that there could be this huge diversity of different species. So two, the weapons that uh, will be available to civilizations, technologically advanced enough to spread through the solar system, galaxy, and so on, could be extremely powerful. I don't think it's unreasonable to allow one's imagination to run a bit wild on the analogy of explaining a smartphone to an Neanderthal. Uh, in addition to known currently existing technologies, there could also be planetoid bombs, which are just asteroids or comets that are deflected. Uh, uh, producing, you know, explosions uh, that are much more devastating even than the, the biggest thermonuclear weapons we have today. Direct energy weapons, laser particle beams, helium beams, uh, you know, maybe weaponized particle accelerator uh, that could be, you know, used for uh, political purposes as kind of blackmail or total destruction by omnicidal agents. And then the third one is as we spread into space, New colony civilizations are going to want their independence, resulting in an anarchic uh, cosmopolitical realm. Anarchic meaning there isn't any over, uh, th there isn't any single governing system that is able to uh, maintain, uh, to coordinate all the different parties and maintain peace uh, uh, between them. That's a point I'll get to uh, um, in just a moment. So preventing conflict, uh, keeping the peace, how do we prevent conflict? Two obvious options. One is a Leviathan, which is what I was just uh, referring to, a, a cosmopolitical governing body to act as a neutral referee, thereby keeping peace. And second, a balance of terror or mutually assured destruction, which is you know, per, what's in part what's uh, uh, enabled us to, to avoid a hot war uh, following World War II up to 1989. But the question is, could either of these be effective? Taking order efficacy of a Leviathan is undermined by the vastitude of space paired with the cosmic speed limit of light. I won't go into the details here, but essentially the idea is that the, the distances of outer space are so huge that there's just uh, timely coordination is going to be impossible. And without timely coordination, cosmic state is not going to be able to fulfill its half of the social contract, which is to keep the peace, to be a neutral referee. So the other option is uh, mutually assured destruction. Um, Dudney has this really fascinating example of Mars versus Earth. 
he asked us to consider if there could be this balance of terror, this, this mutually assured destruction uh, with respect to this configuration, he argues that that's very unlikely. Mars is going to have a huge military advantage over the US. There's a shallow gravity well, which makes it easier to come and go. Proximity to the asteroid belt, that means it has just a huge arsenal of planetary bombs that it could, you know, it, it could use this fact to threaten the US or uh, the, the uh, planet Earth or potentially completely destroy Earth. Uh, there's also, you know, so yeah, therefore there, there's this possibility of an annihilatory first strike. Moving further out in space, again, thinking about these advanced weapons. Uh, particle beams, you know, sun guns, things of that sort. There's the additional problem of for bad to work, you need to know who struck you. But there is this forensic task of identifying who exactly might have launched an attack. That could be extremely difficult when you have hundreds, thousands, millions, billions of different civilizations out there. It's absolutely not like the Cold War, just this simple bipolar situation. This is a radically multipolar situation that uh, will very likely be extremely uh, unstable. So the possibility of, yeah, as I mentioned, super advanced weaponry, especially weapons that inflict catastrophic harms at or near the speed of light could further dissolve the mad dynamic. So those are the two ways that we could possibly keep peace and neither one looks especially promising. Why would there be conflict in the first place? Some transhumanists, such as Milan Sergovic, have argued that becoming, by becoming posthuman, you'll simultaneously become perfectly peaceable. The term belligerent posthuman is, he would apparently argue, a contradiction of terms. I take this to be more or less an argument from magic. It's implausible techno utopian reasoning, but it also misses some important facts about rationality in, in game theory, which I'll mention in a moment. But okay, the last question to ask is why would there be conflict in the first place? There are, I think, many reasons to believe that conflict could break out. Dudney points out that many colonies throughout human history have resorted to war uh, and violence for their independence. He also notes that imperialist states have often gone to war over new territory. Why wouldn't there be, contra uh, Sirkovic, belligerent civilizations? Some may evolve either naturally or through directed intelligent design, or both, to become warlike. Some may develop apocalyptic doomsday ideologies that compel them towards violence. Indeed, I've argued that, well, okay, I just mentioned this, some of the, the most catastrophically violent conflicts in history have been driven by underlying eschatological convictions. There's also the Hobbesian trap uh, or security dilemma, which are different scenarios, but related. Security dilemmas where you have this spiral of militarization. Uh, dr the dramatic diversification of uh, in phylogenetic diversification and phylogenesis would very well undermine trust. So imagine not being able to anticipate the actions or understand the intentions of another species S because the fundamental categories of that species thought are different. Not just thought, but emotion and so on. So it just becomes incredibly difficult to, to, to anticipate what they're going to do. This could easily lead to a spiral of self-perpetuating militarization. Improvements in defensive technologies are interpreted as threats by others who then improve their defensive technologies and so on. Consequently, genuinely peaceful civilization could be drawn into conflict. Hobbesian trap is, is essentially the situation where you are unable to, to uh, know with sufficient confidence that uh, another actor is not going to strike you. And so it's rational for you to strike them first. But of course, if they're rational, they're gonna reason the same way. So even if you have two, again, perfectly peaceable uh, actors, you, the result can be uh, mutual destruction or one-sided destruction. So other advanced civilizations uh, could pose a threat inadvertently as well, conducting high power physics experiments on. So the idea that spreading the space will bring about a peaceful Utopia is often simply assumed, but a closer examination suggests, or at least I would argue, that it could, it could raise rather than lower the probability of conflict. So this suggests that the expected value of the future might actually be negative. All right. And okay, so my screen has frozen again. For some reason, I don't know if it's just coincidence, but when um, Luca, when you've turned on your microphone, um, the screen has been dislodged. Might be coincidence, but maybe you could try that again. Um, I haven't unmuted myself, but uh, I think 
think yeah, it's, I'm not sure. I think it's me giving host to you, but I'm always slow. I'm always like a, a 10 seconds longer than I should be. Um, so it should right. work now, maybe? Yeah, I'm, it's still frozen. So it might just take a moment. Um, I only have two more slides, I think. So, okay, maybe I'll just move on. So the, the argument ultimately is that I think this, this long-termist, the long-termist ideology, as it has been articulated so far in the literature, and again, by long-termist, I, I specifically mean this sort of strong long-termist view, is, could potentially be extremely dangerous if it is taken seriously by powerful actors and it could, you know, it minimizes anything that isn't directly related to uh, existential risk. That is something that's not going to prevent us from fulfilling our potential, which means, you know, essentially becoming post-human, spreading to the, the stars and uh, realizing astronomical amounts of value. And I, so I, I worry along with uh, Vaden, uh, Mazrani and, uh, and uh, Peter Singer and others that this is, the, this is the effect and also that it could potentially justify two individuals who take this ide ideology seriously. It could potentially justify all sorts of dangerous uh, atrocities. And the last, so I'm trying to think the, the last thing that I had the last slide was essentially, why does this matter? Oh, here we go. Okay, good. Yeah, why does this matter? Okay, so because long-termism and EA more generally, uh, they are both a research community and an activist movement, They're actively striving to change the future course of world history. And I, they've been, I've been blown away by how successful uh, they've been. And I expect them to become increasingly influential in the future. Uh, for example, they have 46.1 billion in committed funding, which is just absolutely extraordinary. They, their direct communications to the government, Jason Matheny, who is a long-termist as far as I understand. Uh, in the US, he serves as deputy assistant to the president for technology and national security, deputy director for national security in the Office of Science and Technology Policy and the coordinator for technology and national security at the White House National Security Council. Ord has uh, um, consult, as I recall at least, uh, has been a consultant for some UK government uh, reports and also recently contributed to a report from the Secretary General of the, U the UN that specifically mentions long-termism. And then thirdly, there's all sorts of connections with multimillionaires and multi-billionaires, including some of the most powerful individuals in all of human history, such as Elon Musk. People who will unilaterally make decisions that will significantly affect the sort of future that we all live in and our children live in, uh, but they're, they're making this decision on their own based on business interests and you know, their own uh, adherence to uh, a, a sort of long-termist uh, worldview. Uh, so long-termists have a lot of power and they plan on wielding this power in a largely non-democratic or elitist manner. Ben Gertzel has written about this uh, in, in a compelling way, in a critique, critique of uh, a review of um, Bostrom's book, Superintelligence, he specifically says that Bostrom Yakowski, um, there's a tendency toward elitism that does not strike everyone as benign in its potential consequences. So, for example, there's this Ethiopian writer who had the following to say about Bostrom's scenario of governmentally enforced restriction of AGI development to a chosen few. This is the highway to tyranny. The current world is stained with odious inequality because of such attitudes and systems. The few will be in control of this game-changing high-tech, and then who will control these few? Obviously, those who have guns and money will control these few, and then what? And then instead of protecting mankind from AGIs, we have AGIs destroying the majority of mankind on behalf of the few. Uh, um, Yuval Noah Harari also has a very nice section on uh, the da potential dangers of transhumanism and how that could radically exacerbate uh, uh, global inequality. 
So it's important to note that FHI and other organizations, they're not polling people to see what kind of future humanity itself wants. Rather, they're trying to gain as much power and influence as possible to realize the future that they, from their particular you know, Baconian capitalistic transhumanist perspective, want. The long uh, reflection may sound democratic, but transhumanism, value maximization, and so on seem to be non-negotiable. And I'm happy to talk about that more in the Q&A. Uh, there's also this cancel culture aspect um, which you know David Pierce has uh, written about recently. There are a lot, you know a lot of people who deviate from the the orthodoxy are put themselves at risk of losing funding. And Zoe Creamer and Luke Kemp recently wrote about this. Uh, I'm not going to read the the excerpt, but it's a EA forum post that you, perhaps some people had seen. Um, and there's not just censorship of people or threats made uh, uh, you know, to withhold funding and so on, but there's a tremendous amount of self-censorship because EA has so much money that people are afraid to, to speak out. So yeah, I would say that the, the people at the top do not like to be criticized. So here's the conclusion uh, that I was clumsily trying to, to articulate earlier. Uh, the ideology of long-termism is I would contend dangerous, built upon dubious philosophical foundations and includes ideological components that are actively contributing to the growing probability of a global catastrophe, namely from advanced tech and climate change. Meanwhile, the community of long terms is quite elitist uh, or anti-democratic, has direct connections to extremely powerful actors, and I think doesn't take criticisms well. This is a very bad situation. So as I like to say, we should care about the long term, but, uh, but don't be a long termist. Uh, thank you for listening to me ramble <laughs> for, for longer than I should have. My apologies for that. I think it's okay. <laughs> and thank you for your presentation, Phil. Now we have around 30 minutes for questions. So unfortunately, we probably won't have time to go through all of them. Remember that you in the audience can go to Slido and enter the code, which you can find in the comments, and ask your questions and upload others' questions. So if you're ready, Phil. Let's jump yep. right into yep. the questions. So the first one is, what would you propose as an alternative, alternative to a long-termism that does take well-being of future and current generations, as well as the dangers of long-termism into account? That's a fantastic question. First of all, I would, <laughs> first of all, I would say that there has been some writing, uh, sort of future-oriented writing from non-Western perspectives. And I have found some of that to be, to be very compelling. And it is a completely different gestalt. And it's, it's sometimes it's difficult to, to understand the perspective at first, but with enough effort, <laughs> the gestalt switches, you know, the Necker cube suddenly switches, and there is, there's this kind of whole different, you know, perspective on the future that doesn't emphasize just, you know, uh, quantification and maximization, and, but there's a much more, you know, qualitative kind of emphasis. There's a, a writer, Monica, I'm forgetting her last name, uh, how to pronounce it off the top of my head, but she has written some articles on uh, protopia as an alternative to utopia. And I think some of the so, some of her work, which also I'd be happy to, to share um, even in the, the chat um, se section here, I could find it real fast. It, I think is really good and 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 inspiring, and at, at the very least, I think it's worth reading because it does sort of bring out the just how sort of narrow I think ideologically the the long termist view is, how deeply, inf how deeply neoliberal it is, how infused with sort of capitalist elements and, you know, this sort of Baconian notion that, you know, we, we need to subdue nature and, uh, and, and yeah, th thinking about value in this completely, what I would describe as a very alienating way, uh, that there's just this value out there. It's a property of the universe. It's, and it's, it, it just needs people to be realized. So we just need to create these people who have happy lives. And, and that's, you know, Bernard Williams and some others have, have uh, described this as a very alienating uh, kind of ethical 
worldview. So Monica's work, again, can't remember her last name, on Protopia is, is very good. And, uh, and the other thing I would just say is I have seen just recently um, a burgeoning of literature, of, of writings by people who do not have a long-termist view, who are not particularly sympathetic with total impersonalist utilitarianism, but who are taking seriously these sort of longer term questions. Um, and I myself, so, you know, my approach so far has been, has been, I th it has mostly been philosophizing with a sledgehammer. And rather than building something, it's just, it's, it's more of a destructive act. Like these are some views that I think are clearly wrong and super dangerous. It's an information hazard. I really hope the US, you know, US government or, uh, or just imagine what some far right individual uh, um, might be inspired to pursue if they took the framework of thinking about expected value and all these future people seriously. I think that's really, that's really frightening. Um, so I've mostly been sort of trying to knock down, you know, some of these, the, these ideas, but I myself don't really have a positive answer. I'm still working on that. I'm, I'm, there are puzzles and conundrums in population ethics that are, are just seem, you know, in, in, insoluble. Um, and so I, and therefore I don't have an answer to that. And I'm, I'm still trying to figure out for myself what the best alternative is. That's also super fair. <laughs> so the next question is, would you be happy to make your slides and references available after the end of your talk? Yes, absolutely. Sure. Amazing. Okay. So we have another question, which is, do you think the concrete things long-termists are doing, for instance, AI alignment research, avoiding nuclear and biotechnological disaster, are valuable? Really great question, again. Um, so I, I think it's useful to distinguish between, so you know, I've, I've been working on this, this book for a really long time now on the history of thinking about human extinction. And I wrote a whole draft and then realized, actually they're two fundamentally different issues. They're interrelated, but they're fundamentally distinct. And uh, so I had, to, I had to rewrite everything. And then the book now is two parts. And sorry, I'm, I'm saying this for a reason that part one is concerns the, the study of what could be called kill mechanisms, you know, just some sort of catastrophe scenario, some, some anthropogenic or natural uh, cause that results in our extinction or some global catastrophe. And that goes back to really, well, to the, mid 19th century. And then, you know, 1950s, you get, you know, studies about nuclear war. And then 1990s, really, you get a lot of climate change work. So there's, there's been this tradition of people looking at what are the, what are the means, what are the phenomena that could destroy humanity? And then separately, there is a question, which is ethical and axiological in nature, which is, would extinction be bad? And so that long-termism is, is this, and I think most of X, maybe you know, 60, 70, 80% of existential risk studies has been this, this, this focusing on these moral questions. What, how bad would it be and why? And so, so, so I, and, and here, okay, here's, here's the way to, to articulate, sorry for, for stumbling about. The, I think recently the existential risk studies community has focused on the, the question of kill mechanisms, not just the ethical questions of how bad would our extinction be? Because how many people could exist in the future and you know, how utopian could, the, could our existence become? And I think that's in part because some of the questions about kill mechanisms are conceptual in nature. So climate change, for example, is a robustly empirical issue. The question of whether a nuclear conflict could result in a a nuclear winter is a very much empirical question. Hence, it was scientists who identified them. The issue of ASI, artificial superintelligence, is a deeply philosophical question. It has to do with the nature of rationality, has to do with the, the nature of, of, uh, of agency. 
And so I do think that there is some really good, important stuff that has come out of the existential risk uh, literature, namely the, the articulation of, uh, or the, the, or the pre precisification of certain kill mechanisms. A ASI being the, the paradigm case, where like I find those arguments to be quite convincing. So I, 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 I am happy that, that there is this research being done. I'm pushing back against the, the, the underlying ethical motivation for, for this research. You could, of course, care deeply about ASI like I do. I think there should be an Extinction Rebellion movement focused on ASI. Um, without caring, without saying that, oh, we should need to value, you know, this astronomical number or infinite number of, you know, digital beings in vast computer simulations, you know, trillions and trillions of years from now. So I like that research. I'm critical, deeply critical of the underlying ethical view. I hope that makes sense. I think it does. All right, one has a clarification question. Does the criticism concern the risk of misusage or the actual theoretical implications of long-termism? The first part was, was uh, misusage? Yes. Uh, okay. Um, well, I think that the, if taken seriously, uh, then the, the conclusions of that, for example, that Ole Hextrom gestured at, uh, the, the possibility that he gestured at, uh, and that others like you know Peter Singer more recently have have brought up uh, th those those dangers do seem to follow directly from the premises of the argument. Uh, I mean, Bostrom is clear that you know tiny tiny reductions in existential risk, as defined in the, the way he, in the technical sense uh, that he provides, are morally equivalent to saving the lives of billions and billions of actual living, breathing human beings. Um, and so that right there, that is a, a potentially dangerous <laughs> line of reasoning. And again, this isn't a sort of situation where you say, well, you know, we need to, we need to torture someone to save a million people. This, it's not about torturing someone to save a million people. It's about torturing someone to ensure the birth of a million people. That's the sort of reasoning that's, that's going on there when Bostrom says the expected value of tiny reductions, existential risks are the moral, moral equivalent of saving a billion actual human beings. So I, I guess I'm not worried about someone misusing it. I'm worried about somebody taking it seriously. I, I hope that makes yeah. sense. Yes. Okay. So one asks, is your argument more against utilitarianism, transhumanism, or long-termism? Might we relax one of them to save the other two? Um, I take it that long-termism is by far most compelling when it's built on this sort of total utilitarian view. I mean, I mentioned before that there are uh, plenty of other moral theories that that uh, would certainly take issue with th this th this notion that we need to maximize value. I mean, there are other possible responses to value than maximizing. Um, people have recently put forward arguments where you know th that are based on this notion that you know value is something that we should respond to uh, with attitudes that lead us to preserve the thing value, to sustain it, to, you know, rather than just multiply it. <laughs> like we just need, you know, you know, one happiness, one unit of happiness is good, two unit of, units of happiness is, is twice as good. And uh, that's, that's definitely a highly controversial view. So I take it that long-termism and, and total utilitarianism have a pretty intimate connection. And it's definitely the, probably more than anything, uh, although there's lots to say about this, but the impersonalism that I think is problematic because that's what leads to what I was just mentioning a moment ago where 
uh, you find yourself obligated to torture someone in order to, to prevent a million non-births. And transhumanism, I also think, is, is deeply problematic, not because, of course, um, as, as a non-religious individual, it's not about, it's, it, there's no danger of playing God or anything like that. And I, I certainly agree that the human condition is, is, is not great, <laughs> could be improved upon uh, quite a bit. My main worry is just, it's more pragmatic. I, I find it impossible to imagine how this isn't going to, following Harari and, and, and many others, how this isn't going to just massively exacerbate wealth inequality uh, in a way that, that really could be permanent and, and you know, devastating. So I'm really worried about the, the, the transhumanist uh, program being being realized by you know well Elon Musk and Peter Thiel and and you know these others uh, so it's it's both all right uh, another question if you define utility as average welfare instead of total welfare you get around a lot of your objections from this moral view would you agree with long termism um, well, I mean, from this view, it's the, the notion that we need to, for example, you know, spread into the stars and simulate people. Uh, that is, is not necessarily what is, what would be prescribed, uh, by that, by that view. So I, let me say the, the, I know the vast majority of utilitarians are not average utilitarians, uh, in part because it, it, it averagism, you know, it engenders all sorts of, all sorts of, uh, you know, problems. Uh, you know, particularly in the context of of uh, population ethics. So I'm not sure. Actually, I, I, sorry, I'm being put right on the, sp the spot with the question, I, I would need, to, I think, to think about it for just a few minutes to, to give a, a half competent answer. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's, a really good, it's a really good thought. I'd be curious if anybody has written about trying to embrace a long-termist ethic from the perspective of, of averageism. I haven't come across anything like that so far, but Interesting thought. Yeah, uh, if you feel more comfortable to uh, answer it later, of course, feel free to do so. <laughs> but um, let's move on to another question. To you, what is the strongest argument for long-termism? Good question. Um, well, maybe there are a couple ways to, to answer that. One might be from a more practical perspective. There is, well, th this almost doesn't need to, to, to be said. Th the default view in our society is radical short-termism. And this is sort of baked into a lot of the, the institutions, you know, obviously, you know, government, you know, they're elected, you know, elections are four years or six years or, or whatever. Within the business world, you know, there are quarterly reports. So there is a there is a, inherent in these these uh, institutions is a sort of short term thinking. I'm, I'm, I suspect everybody listening has has thought about that. So, but you know, now some of the risks that we're facing, obviously, are are long term. You know, climate change is going to have effects for ten thousand years. Or so, you know, according to, to most. I mean, that's that's longer than civilization has existed. That's going back almost to the Neolithic Revolution from where we are today, which is twelve thousand years ago. But so I I, I am happy that uh, if if the popularization of long termism has one effect, it sort of nudges people or jolts them 
out of the dogmatic slumber of short-term thinking. I do think, again, there, there are, there's difficult like population ethical questions here, but I very much, you know, more so to put it very crudely, insofar as people exist in the future, uh, then we should, uh, our, the effect on them of our actions absolutely matters. Who those people, like how exactly, they're all different, you know, I mentioned presentism before, they're all different ways of, of thinking about who the, the, the relevant people are when you're comparing, you know, two different um, populations, two different, you know, futures. They're really difficult. I don't have an answer. Uh, I just feel like the more extreme views, the ones that lead to the repugnant conclusion, for example, are the wrong ones. <laughs> and those are the ones that could actually be, you know, uh, really dangerous. So, I, okay, so I, I think that's, I think that's probably the, the, the best thing that's come out of long term is it also may be the fact that thinking about the longer term has, has perhaps been uh, um, connected in some important way with growing interest in AGI and, you know, maybe nanotechnology and, uh, uh, you know, emerging technologies. And I think that's really good. So maybe my, my answer is mostly just practical. I think the, the practical concept, th there are arguments for why long-termism is not all bad, which have to do with raising awareness of, you know, emerging technologies, future potential threats, uh, and also trying to, to sort of dislodge people from the, the default uh, short, very short-termist view. I hope that was a satisfying answer or half satisfying. I think so. <laughs> Okay, um, why do you conflate long-termism and utilitarianism? You can accept G and M's, probably uh, Will and Hillary's form of long-termism without accepting in any case that genocide is permissible. So what do you have to say to that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't mean to conflate it. I, I mean to be clear that what I'm talking about is a particular is a particular interpretation, which I think is the most common interpretation. It's certainly the most compelling. Um, you know, again, if you don't think that merely po the interests of merely possible people should be taken into consideration, or if you don't think that value should just be maximized from this impersonal view, uh, perspective, you know, the point of view of the universe, then um, you're not going to find the, you know, the calculations that, for example, Greaves and McCaskill put for, you know, the 10 to the, the 45 digital beings in our Milky Way, uh, all that compelling. And so the, you know, f f going back to the beginning, you know, to, to basically when Bostrom was, was founding this new field, the, all of the, by far the most compelling arguments are very much infused with utilitarian thinking. And it is the, yeah, it's so it's it's this, I, I take it to be the most common, prominent, and connect, connected to that, the most compelling version of long-termism that I see as the problematic, uh, ver, problematic interpretation that ends up being the target of the critiques. So I, I agree that there's some wiggle room, but um, I don't think it's that much. And even as I'm recalling, um, and I, I hope I'm not uh, misremembering this because it's it's been a little while since I read it, but Ord and Greaves published an article on uh, moral uncertainty. And, you know, I recently saw, you know, a talk with uh, uh, Toby Ord where he said, I'm not a utilitarian. But I feel like that's, it's a bit misleading because so if you read this article that they wrote, they're essentially saying that, again, if I'm recalling uh, correctly off the top of my head, that um, you should adopt a, a, um, a posture, a, a position of moral, that, that affirms moral uncertainty. We don't know what the right moral theory is. But then we can use essentially like expected value theory 
to determine which theory it's most rational to accept. And when you do that, utilitarian, total utilitarianism wins. So this is basically a way then of saying, I'm not a, a total util, utilitarian. I just accept expected value theory and embrace moral uncertainty. Yes, but in practice, when you do that, you end up with total utilitarianism. <laughs> because that is the theory that, you know, by, with respect to that theory, the stakes are astronomically huge if, if there's an existential catastrophe. Not with respect to other theories where the stakes are, are much, much lower. I hope that kind of makes sense. Yes, indeed, this. <laughs> okay, so you're arguing for the dangers of developing powerful technologies. As far as I understand, most long termists agree and are working on this problem AI bio risk. Yeah. So um, <laughs> or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that. I, I th certainly I think it's it's good as I mentioned <laughs> that they're they're working on this, but I guess the, there's one one thing that I've I've been disappointed about is there is some discussion as I'm sure everybody knows of like differential technological development, which I find the argument somewhat weak, but but not completely un, uh, uncompelling. But that is as far as a lot of the existential risk researchers, as far as I know, will go. That maybe we can just, you know, slow down the rate of development of a certain, you know, type of technology to, to alter the, the ordering of uh, order of arrival. One thing that I really wish was discussed more is the Bill Joy option in his 2000 article where he, he basically drawing from the trans, discussions with transhumanists like Hans Morbeck and, and uh, Ray Kurzweil says, yes, these technologies are, are profoundly dangerous. And what we should do then is, is impose moratorium, moratoria on these technologies to prevent them from being developed. That has largely been dismissed out of hand as completely uh, impracticable. And that dismissing itself has been based on a kind of technological determinist position that's sometimes called autonomous technology and that technology is, is dependent upon our individual actions or the actions of, of you know, corporations and so on. But ultimately, the, the, the process of technologization is beyond our control. Nobody can control it. So you, you can't, it's like holding back the tide. You just can't, you, you can't do it. Um, but unfortunately there has been even though there's been some scholarship on technolo differential technological development, there's been just no scholarship on researching the possibility of moratoria. So I, to, to tie this, this all together, uh, hopefully in a somewhat coherent way, um, I'm glad that the ex-riskers are working to ensure that these technologies are safe. But there's also this underlying notion, as I mentioned, that we have to, to develop these technologies in order to become post-human, in order to, to you know, colonize space, at least on Bostrom's astronomical waste argument, to, you know, to, to convert exoplanets into computronium to you know, simulate 10 to 58 people. And yeah, and I'm, I'm not sure that that, I, I wish that there was more research being done on the possibility of somehow bringing at least certain uh, aspects of the enterprise of, of technology to a halt, temporarily or permanently or whatever. So we have more time to, to think about if, if we want, throughout the history of technology, we've, we create them and then we go, uh, oh shoot, <laughs> maybe we shouldn't have done that. And that's just that's just the way the the, the routine way that uh, uh, technological innovation happens, and uh, maybe we should try asking questions beforehand. Like, do we want nanotechnology? Maybe you know molecular nanotechnology. That's something that we should impose a moratorium on. 
and think harder about whether the risks are worth the potential benefits. Great. <laughs> okay, so time is almost up. So we'll have the two last questions now. I will take them one at a time. Um, you seem worried about techno optimism, but if that is the concern, then EA slash long termism seems like a very marginal player, and capitalism is your real enemy. This is what is the real enemy? I'm, I'm so sorry. Capitalism. Ah, yeah. Um, I do think capitalism is uh, <laughs> is a big problem, and yeah, I mean, I maybe. Well, I'm sure everybody's heard that, that sometimes Zizek is is uh, is attributed to him uh, or to various other people. But you know, it's easier to imagine an end to civilization than an end to capitalism. And I I do sort of agree with that. But yeah, I mean, so I, okay, I would say that the, the long termist view, on the one hand, I don't think it's just a trivial uh, player in the shaping of our collective future. For the reasons I mentioned, I mean, they, there, there are direct connections with, you know, Moss mentions Bostrom's ideas all the time. Uh, and, you know, he's funded the uh, Future of Man Institute through uh, Future of Life Institute, which he gave $10, $10 million to and so on. So the, there are some immensely powerful actors. There are, you know, governments are increasingly uh, absorbing some of the ideas from the long-termists literature and there uh, you know the endowment or the the committed funding for long termism is, is really quite huge so i don't think it's it's a trivial actor i do think you're right though that a much deeper uh uh enemy of of human well-being and and to, to borrow a term from uh, uh carl sagan you know planetary hygiene is capitalism and I don't. I, I do spend time <laughs> doing what I can to to, to uh, argue against that view and, and perhaps contribute to to uh, minimizing its its continued influence. But yeah, both both are problematic. Obviously, as I mentioned, there's of course there's a connection. I mean, I feel like the at least the the boss the, the view that emerges in Bostrom and I think is sort of implicit in, in the work of a, a lot of other long termists is just hugely. Uh, consistent, maybe influenced uh, by you know capitalist uh, notions. So there is there's continuity. Uh, uh, you know, long term is in, in a sense is is kind of a um, in, in outgrowth, or, or perhaps one could argue. All right, that makes sense. And unfortunately, we are out of time now. So let's end the session. Thank you so much for joining and speaking for us, Phil. It was a true pleasure to have you here. And also thank you to the audience for joining. Yes, we can give him a virtual or real life applause. <laughs> um, thank you to the audience for joining. I hope that you enjoyed this evening.